I'm Jill Walton, the Director of Alumni Relations at the Terry College, and we're so pleased to see you all here for this first Terry Third Thursday of 2007. We have a great crowd this morning. I was a little bit nervous about the weather, but thank you all for um, brave and I guess the not so bad weather um, and, and joining us this morning. I know we have a lot of first timers here. Um, I was telling Mr. Flanagan that he was a big draw for lots of new folks here. So if it's your first time here at Terry Third Thursday, welcome to the Terry College's Executive Education Center here in Atlanta. This is Terry's home here in Atlanta and we are we're pleased to have you all here today. Um, I want to start by recognizing our sponsors of Terry Third Thursday. We have a few special guests from those sponsor organizations here. Our premier corporate sponsor is the Bank of North Georgia. Elizabeth Livingood, Buzz Law, and Ellie Musiol are here. Buzz, I believe Buzz may be the only one here. Hey Buzz, thanks for joining us today. Our newest corporate sponsor is Deloitte, and Ed Hayes and Jeff Paul are here. Ed and Jeff, thank you so much for what you all do. Our corporate sponsors really make Terry Third Thursday possible. Our two media sponsors are the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Bill Chandler and Sharon Eeks are here. Thank you so much, Bill and Sharon. And from Public Broadcasting Atlanta, Harriet Hoskins Averhall. Go ahead, Harriet, do you have some announcements for us? Not sure if we have our microphones. Okay, you can speak loud enough for us, Harriet. Good morning, everybody. Since we are going to be talking about investments this morning, I thought I would uh, mention to you very briefly um, a, an initiative that Public Broadcasting Atlanta has been taking in television, radio, and the web. Uh, we're on. Um, as a result of a grant we've got from an outfit called the Investor Protection Trust. This is a collection house uh, for all the fines played by major financial institutions for corporate fraud. Um, the money is available state by state only to nonprofits for investor protection and education. So we've had six months on all three mediums um, with education minutes on radio and TV money track series on television and uh, a chat room actually I know it's called a discussion board on the web where you can share your stories and give advice um, of course public broadcasting accepts no responsibility but um, perhaps the most exciting thing we've done is 13 reports from different reporters around town on various types of investment fraud and they're now on, D on uh, CD in a series, and for good friends like Terry College, uh, they might be available. And they really are very interesting, both in scope and content. Um, another interesting factor which we found out um, was that the chief group of people who tend to be scammed, if you like, um, are not the elderly and women, as most people assume, but in fact, highly literate, well-educated, well-to-do uh, professionals and business people. It seems that when they come under stress, they jump at all sorts of things, lots of them uh, through the internet, but in many other ways too. So we're going to be concentrating on that group um, if and when we get our grant renewed. Um, just as an antidote to all, all that, um, television, you should look on... Uh, February the 28th at 9, we've got a series called Oprah's Roots, um, which is uh, part of uh, the African American Live series where uh, people's uh, ancestry is being traced where necessary through DNA. And uh, Oprah is one of eight uh, famous people who are uh, being astonished by what can be found. And I think it's probably true for any ethnicity, but particularly interesting for African Americans since uh, their ancestors, when they were slaves, had no names. Thanks so Thank much, you. Harriet. Thank you. I wanted to tell you about a couple of upcoming programs that we have. Our next couple months of Terry Third Thursday speakers are 
um, are set and we'd love for you to come back in the next couple months and the rest of the year actually and join us for those speakers. Next month, February 15th, is Richard Anthony who is the chairman and CEO of Synovus and as you know Synovus is a $30 billion holding company with banks, but banks spread all over the southeast and Bank of North Georgia is actually a part of um, Synovus. Um, March 15th, our March speaker is John Van Vlissingen. John is a senior international executive lecturer for the Terry College and speaks on campus a lot to our students. He's the chairman of BCD Holdings in the Netherlands but their U.S. Um, operations are based here in Atlanta and you may recognize BCD Travel, Park and Fly. So um, go online or give us a call and register for those upcoming programs. And I'm sure Jennifer Allen, who is standing outside at our registration table, would even love to sign you for a season packet, a season ticket pass for Terry Third Thursday. And you get that at a discounted rate. So come and join us and bring, bring friends as well. A couple of upcoming alumni events for Terry College alumni, our annual MBA alumni reunion and golf tournament will be held in Athens Friday and Saturday, April 20th and 21st. Um, the golf tournament that's held every year will actually be back at the UGA golf course, which is newly, um, newly designed and uh, redesigned and improved. And um, we'll have a weekend full of events um, besides the golf tournament, um, a Friday night dinner with all NBA alumni at the Ray Nicholson House, which is just near, the, near Brooks Hall. And if you're not into golf, on Saturday, we've got campus tours, Museum of Art tour, baseball games, softball games, and we'll wrap up that evening with um, class get-togethers um, for our special classes who are, who are celebrating parties. Buck Wiley, who's here today, is on our NBA Alumni Reunion Committee, um, and he can give you more details about that, but Buck, thanks for all you're doing um, with that. Uh, the biggest Terry event of the year will be our Alumni Awards and Gala, which will be held May 5th at the Weston Buckhead, just across the Lenox parking lot here. Uh, we'll be honoring several folks that evening. Bill Griffin, who is the Managing Director of Fidelity National Information Services. Jamie Reynolds, of course, a real estate developer you'll recognize from Reynolds Plantation. Our young alum award winner is Allison O'Kelly, who was a past speaker here at Terry Third Thursday, the CEO of MomCore. And finally, Earl Leonard, who I'm sure many of you know, retired VP from the Coca-Cola Company, will receive our Dean's Distinguished Service Award for all of his service to Terry. Um, the gala portion of the Alumni Awards and Gala will have a live and silent auction, and all the monies that we raise that evening will go to support new facilities for the Terry College. There are lots of ways that you can get involved if you're interested. Please see me. We're looking for unique live and silent auction items, corporate sponsors. If you're interested in ticket purchasing, just See, um, see me or Elizabeth Williman from our alumni relations staff or Jennifer Allen, and we'll be glad to talk to you more about that. But to get on with our program for today, I'm going to ask Richard Quartz to, to come on up. Richard's vice president with Carter, and he chairs our Terry Third Thursday task force, and he gets all these wonderful speakers that we have at Terry Third Thursday to come and, and give us these um, wonderful programs. Richard's been on our alumni board since um, 2002. He's a 1995 graduate of the Terry College and a 2006 Outstanding Young Alumni Award winner and um, we're just so pleased with with everything that Richard helps us with and Richard I'm going to have you come on up and introduce our speaker for today. Thank you Jill. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, Martin Flanagan uh, is uh, president and CEO of InvestCap, a position he's held since August of 2005. He's also a member of their board of directors. Um, InvestCap is one of the leading global investment management firms uh, operating here in Atlanta. Uh, some of their brand names that you may be familiar with are AIM Investments, Invesco, Invesco Perpetual, uh, Atlantic Trust, um, and AIM Trimmark. Uh, Marty came to uh, InvestCap from Franklin Templeton where he was uh, president and co-CEO. Uh, let's see, InvestCap maintains its corporate headquarters in, in London, um, but uh, the, the U.S. headquarters is here in Atlanta. Um, and the company manages about $440 billion uh, asset, uh, assets under management. Uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, shocking when you think of a $440 billion company uh, based here in Atlanta. Pretty exciting. 
Uh, Marty is now in his second year as chairman of investment, the uh, Investment Company Institute, which is uh, the investment in industry's primary uh, trade organization, which is uh, quite a uh, uh, undertaking as well. Um, he also has two undergraduate degrees um, from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and he's also a member of the executive board at the Cox School of Business in, at a SMU. Kind of an interesting little uh, piece of history. Uh, Al Nemai, who was dean of the Terry College when I was actually an a undergraduate, uh, was uh, is now at the Cox School as their dean. So there's a little bit of crossover there, and um, so I'm sure Al's doing a great job down uh, at the Cox School, and we appreciate uh, your being a, a participant there as well. So let me uh, go ahead and have Marty come on up here and, and uh, talk to us about uh, investing in America's future. Uh, good morning. I uh, found out why everybody's here this morning, and it has nothing to do with uh, the topic. <clears throat> it's all about us getting out of carpools, I heard. So uh, that all brought us here. So, uh, and Harriet, I, I liked your comments very much, and uh, very much am a believer in public broadcasting and uh, investor protection, and I think that's a great thing. I did get a little nervous, though, when you said uh, people that get ripped off are well-educated, well-heeled people, looking like people here, and uh, <clears throat> sophisticated people get ripped off. I'm not selling a thing, I promise you. So uh, we can all be safe here and we'll get into uh, talk about whatever topic you want. Uh, so <clears throat> um, investing in America and I think uh, how I start to look at things and a topic that is you know on our plate each and every day when you read the paper to hear the news, it's uh, the challenges for saving for retirement. It was a brawl publicly a couple of years ago here in the United States. Uh, we often hear what's missing, uh, the problems with Social Security, Medicare costs rising, uh, or health care costs rising, Medicare not covering uh, the expenses. Uh, pension plans are no sure bet. We hear them falling apart each and every day, the defined benefit, defined contribution plans. <clears throat> and uh, so it's pretty easy to get depressed. And you can say, you know, glass is half full. But I look, you know, I'm a very optimistic person. I think we have a great future. And I think what I'd like to do is really talk about this in a greater context uh, today and you know, what are we doing right? What is the industry doing right to help people save? And what is happening in the world which might impact this uh, topic for us? Uh, just quickly, uh, InvestCap, we are headquartered here in Atlanta. We manage about $460 billion. We do one thing, we manage money for people around the world. Uh, the market cap is about $10 billion uh, for the organizations with the larger public money management firms in the world. Uh, the brands in the United States are what Richard mentioned, uh, really retail institutional high net worth types of businesses, uh, very strong positions in uh, places like Canada, like the UK and emerging markets such as, such as China. Uh, we currently manage about $460 billion, and probably what's most unique about us as an organization is that we do have key, strong depth and breadth of money management capabilities around the world, in Europe, in Asia, uh, in North America, and that is somewhat unique for a money management organization, um, not necessarily for, for other organizations, but it is for money management. <clears throat> Our primary listing is on the London Stock Exchange. There's a long history to that. But the world headquarters actually is here in Atlanta. Uh, and it's uh, uh, from the roots of the chairman uh, prior to me, uh, Charlie Brady, a longtime uh, uh, Atlanta resident. I know he went to the wrong school. He went to Georgia Tech. But he told me that's a pretty good school, too. Um, <coughs> but I won't start that uh, food fight in this room here. So uh, our strategy is a very simple one. Um, when we look at the world, uh, there's needs for people around the world to manage money. Um, uh, we just grow as a global asset management firm. The, the mo about half the money you can manage in the world is in the United States. The other half is outside of the United States. So you look at that as an opportunity. There are many, many dynamic markets around the world that are growing, and uh, we plan to participate in those. So it's a great opportunity for money management organizations, for financial services generally, uh, to be in this business. Markets are evolving. We know that very clearly, and we can feel it here in the United States. But I think it's pretty healthy to step back and put it in the context of why is this happening? What are some of the dynamics that 
might be impacting our lives here, ultimately in the United States. And it's really changes in demographics and economic trends around the world. It's a real challenge for all of us, but it's actually, frankly, quite an opportunity. Uh, population growth around the world has expanded very, very rapidly over the last decades. Uh, there has been an enormous amount of wealth uh, that has been created for savings and investing uh, within uh, our, our businesses. Additionally, retirement savings markets are evolving just not in the United States, but in many markets around the world. There are many different models that we can look at. Uh, there are markets that are doing a much better job of retirement savings than we are here in the United States. The result is there is an absolute growing amount of investable assets, but there is a greater need more and more for individual investors to have their money invested in a very thoughtful, meaningful way. Let's take a look at some of these trends. <clears throat> There's about 6.5 billion people around the world. I think we're all keenly aware of it. The, the population has grown threefold over the last five years. Uh, the United States has just under 300 uh, bill, uh, million people. And when you compare that to markets we hear about each and every day, the impact of China or India, where the populations are three and four times that of the United States, and there are also economies that are growing very, very rapidly, two and three times uh, the speed that we are growing here in the United States. But in each of these markets, the needs are very, very similar for individuals. Uh, at the end of the day, we're all humans. We all want to send, a, send our kids to college. We need to find a way to pay for that. Uh, we all want to buy a home, and we all need to prepare for retirement. So there's a huge, growing middle class in the world. In Asia is one that, again, is growing very, very rapidly. So not only are these populations growing and the expansion of the economy is having a huge impact on the wealth that's being created, um, you can see how household uh, financial assets are now $119 trillion. And I you know, just try to imagine how much money that is. I can't. Uh, it's just an enormous amount of money. And <clears throat> So what, when you look outside of the United States, household assets on a per capita basis have been gro growing more rapidly. We would suspect that just from the base that uh, these different co countries are growing from. And uh, the middle class is becoming more prosperous. Though th that's really the good news of where we start. But there is a vast need for greater education and financial knowledge for people that have generated this wealth for themselves. Savings level is a topic that we hear uh, often. Uh, while we've seen population growth, we've seen huge growth uh, economically in these different markets around the world. Again, it's these changes in retirement needs and, uh, uh, yeah, and how we can help people save for retirement. In the United States, we hear time and time again that we have a problem. Our savings rate is low relative to other countries in the world, but in particular, we can feel the impact here where we talk about individuals not having enough money for retirement uh, when they reach that age. <clears throat> but I think what is very, very important is, let's go back to the examples of China, which has about 22% of the world population, or India, about 20% of the world population. When you look at their GDP, and this is what is sort of missing in this conversation, um, is that China's percent of world GDP is 4%. Uh, India's is 2%. Now let's come back to the United States. The population in the United States represents about 5% of global population, much smaller than these countries. We realize that. But the fact is 25% of the world GDP is generated from here in the United States. So with our savings challenge, just slight movements in savings rates will do generate huge amounts of money to help people save for retirement. So we're actually in a much better situation if we can change some of the structural issues here in the United States to meet the needs uh, for uh, individual investors. There is a growing trend of greater uh, reliance on self-funded pension plans. This is sort of a social change that's happened over the last number of decades. Uh, it is an opportunity for the money management industry. It is a challenge for individual investors, and it's something that I think we all want to deal with uh, as thoughtfully as possible. What are some of the other trends that uh, people are facing? Over the last 20 years, there's been great prosperity uh, for individual investors, but I get pretty basic when I think about you know, how we as individuals deal each and every day and some of the challenges in front of us. And the first one is time. Uh, the reality is 
uh, individuals have less time than they have had in the past. Uh, it puts a challenge when you think of things of it's hard enough to get through a day, much less thinking about the financial needs you have as, as an investor. Uh, the second trend is really the availability of information. There was limited information available for investors you know, many years ago. Today, in my point of view, there's excessive amounts of data out there. And so when you think of ourselves, uh, great tools such as the internet are available. There's endless amounts of information. So let's think of ourselves. So we have less time. There's more data than ever before available to us. And that ultimately, you know, I get pretty scared about that. that. That's a bad formula. You can make some pretty bad decisions pretty quickly uh, with that. And again, it's an obligation, I think, on all of us in the financial services industry to be helpful to people, to be more thoughtful about how to invest for the future uh, <clears throat> as, as we go through our, through our life. The next uh, element that I think is very, very realistic, we've historically been all very focused on our domestic uh, markets around the world. <clears throat> it's impossible to continue to do that. Um, the good news is it's an opportunity for investors, but for individuals, again, it's quite a challenge to comprehend the impacts of global markets and how that might impact how I might invest for my future. And the final trend is one, historically, we, we would think as individual investors of stocks and bonds and how we might invest in, in, in those different uh, instruments. There's been a rapid change towards managed products and packaged products, whether it be ETFs, mutual funds, hedge funds, and new instruments such as derivatives. A very, very different environment. Again, uh, great developments, fantastic opportunity for people, but we have to help people be thoughtful about how to use these di different instruments and how best can we create an investment program for individuals. So given these trends around the world and some of the uh, changes uh, for each of us as individuals, let's come back to the United States and uh, what are we doing right to help people save for retirement? Uh, the good news is if you look at uh, workplace savings, uh, that's clearly a winner for investors. Seven out of 10 individual investors in this country said workplace savings was very, very important for them. That's the good news. So we're, we're starting with some with some good thoughts there. Uh, the majority of, the Amer of Americans, all ages, all education levels, are very likely to participate in employer-sponsored plans. Uh, what we have to have is employers having the plans. Uh, but when they're in place, uh, good things happen. So clearly, people want to save. Uh, it's a good mechanism to help solve uh, future needs for individuals. And then if you look over the last decade, go back to 1980, and look at how things have changed from the defined contribution plans to one that is moving much more towards defined benefits. And the shift over the last 25 years has been just absolutely extraordinary. 1980, 83% of all retirement plans were defined um, benefit plans. It's almost been flipped on its head uh, over the last uh, uh, 25 years. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> when you look uh, also with what's happened, uh, there's been a, a big shift towards, uh, excuse me one second, um, different types of savings, uh, lifestyle uh, savings plans that have been put in place for people. Life cycle assets are another development that has made investing for individuals much easier over time. And many of these are in 401k plans, which is a good development. It's a very mobile workforce as we move uh, jobs, which is a, a U.S. phenomenon. We can bring our savings with us, uh, which is a, a, a very, very Im important development. <clears throat> uh, the other good news is if you look at what's happened uh, recently, um, the, uh, in Washington, lawmakers have made some very, very important developments. I'd say early stage developments, but it's really the Pension Protection Act which has increased contribution limits, uh, which I think is very, very important to us. There's catch-up provisions for older individuals where you can put more money away into savings, uh, the encouragement of automatic enrollment. These are simple developments, but very, very important uh, uh, as we're trying to get people to increase their savings rates. <coughs> 401ks are uh, not the only uh, area where in fact, there's been successful developments over the year. IRAs 
has been another vehicle that has worked very, very well. There's $4 trillion in IRAs right now. There's one quarter of the retirement system outside of Social Security. Uh, we all know the benefits of 401k, or of IRAs, the, you know, the defined build up, or deferred buildup from a tax point of view. But what I think is really striking is if you go back in time, in 1980, when the universal tax deduction was put in place, you can see what happened. Uh, this a massive increase in contributions by individuals into the IRA market. And you can now go post-1986 and say, what's happened? It's just dropped like a rock. What has happened since then is it's gotten much more complex to put money away into the IRAs and very complicated limits. What do people do when it's very complicated, when you have to work to make a decision? We don't do anything. And you know, these are simple thoughts, I think, that are, uh, you know, when I spend time with uh, members of Congress and just the simple notion of simplify things. We, what's a 401k, an IRA, a you know, 529 plan to keep going on and on? Who knows what these things mean? And you leave this room, and it's hard enough for us in this room, most Americans aren't going to make any decisions. And that's a real challenge, I think, for all of us in front of us uh, to help meet some of these challenges. <clears throat> With 401ks and IRAs, uh, what happens to be a vehicle that has played a very, very important role and that's really been the growth of the mutual funds over the last uh, number of decades. Uh, there are other innovations that are very important in uh, complementing the mutual funds. ETFs, I think, are another vehicle that have, have uh, taken hold. Uh, you can see it each and every day again when uh, uh, you, know, you read the paper. Mutual fund assets today are $16.2 trillion. It's a 70% increase since uh, 1998. It's uh, really incredible what's happened around the world. When you come back to the United States, uh, Half of the mutual fund assets are here in the United States. We are the leader in mutual funds. We are really uh, leading the way for the rest of the world. We tend to be a model. 54 million Americans at households own mutual funds. It really has been a vehicle that has been uh, very, very beneficial uh, to meet many investors' needs. <clears throat> so let me uh, wrap it up and we can get into some questions. Uh, the opportunities in front of us are absolutely tremendous. I think all of us, there's little, little question about that. There's need for trusted investment advice in this growing com you know, complex world for each and all of us. Uh, working with Congress to work through some of these uh, thoughts are very important. And I think some of the messages I think hopefully we would all take is when we talk about retirement savings, it gets pretty political very, very quickly. Um, we really can't start there. We really have to start with the problem and just have some facts in front of people so we can be thoughtful about how to meet the needs of individual investors in the United States. It's a competitive requirement for us in the United States, and it will surely be a problem that all of us will own if we don't try to get some very clear thought around it. And uh, I think we just all really need to, uh, to spend time on it. It's an important topic. So I'm going to stop there and uh, open up to any questions anybody might have and for any topic. Yes. Janet and Bescap, um, you've you've spoken this morning about the need for retirement savings, and obviously, uh, you uh, as a company sold off uh, your Invesco unit, which was your record-keeping arm. Where do you see, um, I guess, Invescap in the future, kind of addressing those needs for retirement savings besides the the uh, the vehicles themselves with your um, yeah. with your so a, a, as a company, I, I mentioned earlier, we manage money in a range of diff for different range of clients, historical, retail, institutional, and <laughs> private wealth. And uh, Invesco sold off a, a record-keeping system uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I think what you're seeing happening is traditional definitions of retail and institutional are becoming totally blurred. Uh, this uh, Pension Protection Act sort of reinforces that. And as a money management firm, what we should do and what we need to do well is be able to manage money for individuals meeting their, their breadth of need. Uh, there are other organizations that do a better job of record keeping than money management firms. And uh, that was really the thought that we had. And I think if you sort of think through that, uh, the simple picture in my mind is that money management firms have to have the institutional money management capability, but also with this historical retail capability of a mutual fund because more and more 401k plans, when you look through them, 
they tend to be a holder of mutual funds or having this need to uh, uh, service the clients, uh, whether they're company employees or uh, the advisor that the company has employed. So uh, we haven't backed away from it. We just think we're responding more to the, the industry dynamics uh, here in the United States. Yes. Yeah, so uh, how, how would I describe how we manage the portfolio managers? Um, within uh, our organization, by way of example, there are 600 investment professionals around the world within InvestCap. Uh, there's a vast range of investment capabilities from uh, here in Atlanta, uh, there's a global equity team, uh, there is a structured product team in New York, there's a, a, a UK team in, um, uh, in, in London, there's uh, you know, a China team in China, it goes really around the world. And so when I step back, and it's a core belief from sort of growing up in the money management world, is uh, different investment professionals have different skills. And maybe a, a simple thought, think of a growth fund manager and a value manager. They look at the world differently. They believe in fundamentally different things. And you really need to uh, keep the separate disciplines in place nurture the discipline, ensure that money managers stay wedded to their investment discipline, and make sure that when I as a client, or you as a client, put money with that money manager, that they meet your expectations of how they would manage money. Uh, and it's really being uh, dedicated to the investment process put in place. So what we try to do is keep these separate teams in place, give money managers all the resources they need, but what we want to reinforce is that uh, they deliver for their clients in the style that was that you you hope you signed up for. So I don't know if I'm getting to your question exactly. Yeah. 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 Which which are you a star system or a committee system? Yes. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Uh, <laughs> Let, let's talk about that. And, I, and I, again, this gets to, we have a structured products group, which is basically very quantitative asset management capability, uh, very reliant on mathematical models and market histories. Uh, no one in this room could name a person you know, from that team. Uh, there's a fellow in the UK named Neil Woodford. He is, uh, manages more money than any individual in the United Kingdom. He's a star, period. Uh, the balance, I think, that what you have is, and it tends to be with more active managers that you get these stars, or the Peter Lynch's, John Templeton's, there's a handful of these individuals. The obligation, I think, of a, mo of a money management firm is that when you have that talent is to retain the talent, but also I think what's important is that if that person happens to get hit by a car, you want to know, as an investor, in fact, there's a team behind that person and that process continues to be re repeatable. And uh, uh, when I joined the Templin organization many, many years ago in the 80s, uh, I can't tell you how many times I was told when Sir John retires that we're, we were going to be out of business. Well, um, you know, the company has thrived post John Templeton, and uh, you never replace legends like that. But what you have to do as an organization is, in fact, make sure that you're, you know, dedicated to those, those thoughts and processes that individuals had like that. Hey, um, I have a real quick question relative to working at Franklin Templeton versus AmbestCap, and, and if you can speak to, you know, the differences there, I think it'd be really neat. The other thing is, to me, growing up in Atlanta, it doesn't seem like AmbestCap or Invesco has spent a lot of money building a brand as much as, say, Franklin Templeton has, and right. I'm wondering... Is that just a different because you're, you know, maybe more business to business oriented, where Franklin Templeton is more right. consumer focused? Right. Uh, great questions. Uh, one very important difference is it's really humid here in August as compared to uh, San Francisco. So I've noticed that as a big, big difference. So actually, I, uh, I've, uh, I'm looking at uh, Neil Quirk and, and Eddie Neal and uh, two of the first people I met here, and uh, I'll never forget, you know, we surprised our kids when we were moving here. Uh, we sort of made a decision in two weeks, we're, we're moving, and uh, uh, we're on a plane leaving San Francisco, and it's a foggy day, and I said, don't worry, kids, uh, you, you know, you, you know they, we're leaving that ugly fog, so that's a great thing, and we're flying into Atlanta, 
and I look out the window and it looks like fog. I'm like, what is that all about? Well, it's the humidity here in August, so my kids walked out of the plane about fell over. So uh, that's an important uh, difference. So uh, uh, <clears throat> you're asking, so let me ask, why uh, I believe deeply in global asset management firms. That's how I grew up. Uh, that's where it started in my Templeton roots and ended up at Franklin Templeton. And that's what the organization did. The attraction to me was Investcap. There was a period of time uh, in the late 90s when Franklin Templeton, we were on our back, taking the company apart, trying to put it back together. And Investcap was a world beater, uh, just knocking the ball out of the park. And, uh, you know, I got tired of hearing about how great they were. Uh, yeah, ended up, uh, you know, the, the shoes on the other foot. Uh, the organization went through some very difficult times. And really much off, uh, if you go back to the late 90s, the, the two fastest growing mutual fund companies in the United States were owned by Investcap. The Invesco retail business out of Denver and Amy. Uh, the technology and telecom bubble burst and it hurt in a very serious way. And uh, you know, not unique to this organization. Um, and then you ended up with you know, mutual fund scandals, a very, very difficult time. So to me, the opportunity was when you look in it, you observe very, very talented people around the world, a global footprint that you really cannot repu replicate, very hard to do with some really talented people, uh, whether it be in the United Kingdom. You, uh, we're the we have the largest joint venture in China. Uh, we're a very well-known manager in Hong Kong. And these are sort of in the firm, from my point of view here, was managed more as separate standalone business entities. The opportunity is to bring those global skill sets to investors here in the United States and vice versa. And so what you will see over time is a much more integrated global asset management firm, keeping the investment management team separate, keeping them very dedicated to what they do, because that's what we believe in, but at the same time, bringing those skills here to the United States or from the United States to other markets around the world. So yeah, I get very excited you know, about the opportunities and uh, uh, I think we're starting to make some real good progress. And uh, from a branding point of view, I, I agree. We, uh, you know, meeting people here, hi, what do you do? Uh, why work for Ambescap? They say, what? No, that's interesting. Okay, uh, how about Invesco? So it, you know, how about Atlantic Trust? So uh, you know, it, 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 here in Atlanta, it's amazing. It, it's actually a very large, really somewhat important global asset management firm that is one of the greatest secrets in Atlanta. I, I, it was amazing to me um, that how, how, how little recognition uh, uh, the, the company has from you know, the founder, Charlie Brady, uh, really building one of the more unique asset management firms in the world. So. Yes? I was excited about your PowerShares acquisition last year. Can you talk a little bit more about that and explosive growth and ETFs? And sure. Uh, we we uh, uh, bought a company called PowerShares, and it's an ETF provider and uh, exchange-traded funds. I think uh, the evolution there, I, I sort of looked at it uh, sort of five, ten years ago as ETFs was sort of modern-day index or a listed index is how I thought about it. And you're seeing these evolutions now, too. Uh, I should be very careful of the words because uh, the SEC, uh, um, uh, I'll call it enhanced index uh, products through ETFs. And what we saw happening was, uh, if you think years ago, uh, how um, investment advisors were matching off against individuals, um, it's, it's changed dramatically where the investment advisor, uh, financial consultant, uh, really wants an array of capabilities uh, for their clients, whether it be uh, 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 wrap fees, mutual funds, or ETFs, and really managing the whole relationship for a client. And we saw ETFs as being a very, very important complement to um, uh, very active management. And um, this company we bought um, uh, yeah, last summer. Uh, a very entrepreneurial fella out of Chicago, and uh, the assets are eight and a half billion dollars. Uh, and it, it wasn't two years ago they had three hundred million dollars under management. So, the ETS phenomena is a real one, and um, I think an important one uh, within our industry. Yes, ma'am. Here, I didn't sell anything yet, did I? <laughs> Game closed. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does the U.S. deficit 
influence um, investable assets in the U.S. and also the 50% of investable assets or investors globally who are not part of the U.S. scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, they become very interrelated. I, I think uh, the reality of the situation is uh, of the investable assets for households, uh, you know, as individuals, uh, individuals are owners of them. And I think uh, one of the things I was talking about was the need to do you know, a greater job of managing them. Um, if, if we're not financially sound as a country, uh, what tends to happen is you know, somewhat you, you see pressure on your currency. You become much less competitive in the global marketplace, uh, whether it be trade. Um, and you see emerging trade deficits coming out of those types of things. It is uh, a situation that uh, ultimately is not sustainable for, uh, you know, for a country. And, uh, the topics of you know, back to India, back to China, those are real developments, and I think uh, they are, uh, you know, a long way to go. We are a much more powerful country than um, some of these emerging countries, but we surely have to pay attention to what they bring to the market. And uh, you know, we all preach to ourselves uh, financial discipline. Well, as a country, you need it too, and I think that's probably a, a topic that is we're all talking about with. Uh, uh, you know, our, our representatives uh, in government, but an important one. And I'd say, uh, uh, off on a tangent, and if you, uh, our Treasury Secretary Paulson, I think, is doing a phenomenal job, and I think he has put the topic of our competitive position uh, in global markets uh, on the table, front and center, and um, I, I think it's uh, uh, something that will get serious consideration, and we do need to address it. Um, I do want to remind everybody to try and use a microphone so we can get this on the webcast, but kind of off of Harriet's question, you mentioned 50 percent of investable assets are here in the U.S. and 50 percent are abroad. Um, how is that going to change over the next 20 years looking at India and China as you know, arguably half of the world's population? And then just a, a, a second question, um, what are some examples of changes that can be made in our retirement system? From a congressional standpoint, uh, that you yeah. would, you're a fan of. Yeah, I mean, I'll start there and go backwards. I mean, I, I, you know, you, you can make it really complicated, and it is complicated, and we can just stop the, the you know, any progress at all. Um, you know, a, a very, very powerful thing to get done is to simplify the system. And, you know, if you simply had uh, sort of retirement accounts for individuals and call it safer retirement, and everything goes into it whether it's from the employer, from the individual. Uh, you would take billions of dollars of friction costs out of the system. You would encourage people to save. Uh, things like automatic enrollment are important. You know, th those are simple structural changes, and you're not getting into anybody's philosophical belief of safety nets and Social Security and leave that off to the side. Without even talking about that, we can make important changes. So uh, again, I, I, you know, incremental changes are, are something that we, we have to deal with. Um, and then. Um, I'm sorry, Richard, I, I forgot the other point. So the impact of some of these emerging markets on us? Um, yeah, uh, what could happen in time? Well, uh, back to Harriet's point, I, I think uh, you know, the fact is we are an economic engine of the world. Uh, we are uh, high levels of innovation and et cetera, et cetera. We, we need to keep that competitive nature in place. Uh, the other reality of these countries with um, you know, huge populations, uh, they're at different cycles in their, in their life cycle. and. Uh, uh, you know, there tends to be, uh, you know, boom and bust with situations like that, and you cannot uh, underestimate the importance of um, uh, the rule of law, uh, property rights, uh, you know, the, the issues of uh, dealing uh, of commerce in a very, very clear way, and I think these will ultimately be challenges. China's behind where India is. I think India is actually more attractive from, from that point of view uh, on those. So, uh, Again, the, the sheer size and uh, the ethic and the education are, are things that we have to pay a lot of attention to, but there's still a lot of development and other core principles for economies to be successful w before I think we would get unseated. But, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't predict the future. It all depends on our actions. Yes? 
I'm I'm an old fashioned guy, uh, almost 87 years old, and uh, I'm amazed at the amount of capital that you say you're managing, your company's managing. <coughs> I uh, never believed in turning what little wealth I have over to someone else to manage. Yeah. Because I have friends who've done that, and brokers have simply churned them to death. And so I, I'm surprised. I don't know how you gain the confidence of people to put their money into your company to invest for them. Yeah. I know that I'm old fashioned, but I just don't understand how they could do that. I've, I haven't accumulated a lot of wealth, but I've done all right investing in good common stocks. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'll keep on doing that. But I, I, I have friends in the business of investing other people's money, but I just don't believe in doing it myself. So I, I, I'm a, I congratulate you on what you've accomplished. Well, uh, more importantly, I congratulate you on what you've done. I think that's, uh, you know, you're hitting at a core core issue for people. Um, one, it's an interest of you, yours, and secondly, you, you know, you've uh, obviously done very well at it. Um, and again, I think it's this fundamental issue of, um, uh, you know, where, where do you have the expertise, where do you have the time? And that's where I think, again, money management firms, each and every day you have highly trained individuals managing money. You then go into, I think, again, what's been important development are um, things such as packaged products to help people more simply understand, uh, I want exposure to China, I want exposure to the United Kingdom, I want exposure to large cap stocks, I want exposure to s something that's more simple. But I, I will say, the financial uh, advisors of the world uh, I think have come a very long way in doing a very, very good job for uh, for uh, investors. Again, though, you get to a point where uh, when we hear the stories where individuals have been treated poorly, uh, it's a devastating impact, not just to the individual, but also to the fundamental trust and need of individual investors. And I think that's why funds such as you know investor trust funds and investor education just are just absolutely paramount in everything we do. Um, it is a more complex world, and we need trustworthy, honest people managing money for people when they choose to do that. So, I had a question sure. on uh, ETFs and the new products, financial products that are coming on, and uh, is that going to broaden things? Because this other question was asked, I, mine want to bring it down a little more specifically to the com commodities industry. Is our ETF going to bring commodities into the basic investment uh, pool of retirement funds and other other things like that? Well, uh, there, they are there. You know, you, there are uh, ETF commodity funds, and again, I, I think uh, I, uh, I don't want to pass individual judgments on uh, how, how people should invest their money, and I think that's, again, you know, being thoughtful about risk exposure and time horizons and, and comfort levels are important. You know, commodities are an asset class that uh, you know, are important and you can get exposures in different ways to them. Uh, I think uh, no different than commodities, uh, you go through cycles and uh, right now the commodity cycle has been very, very interesting to people because it's, there's been such a run of it. And um, uh, again, just being thoughtful on a long-term investment program is a whole lot better than reacting to what's hot. I think we all know of uh, some very sad stories of uh, it's always the last man into a hot product uh, or a hot asset category tends to be very uh, disenchanted. Um, and uh, a well-diversified portfolio is probably the, the best answer to, to all of that. Is that it? Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for the time. And it's a real pleasure to meet some people in the community. Thanks, Richard. I want to thank Marty for uh, coming and, and speaking to us this morning. We have a couple gifts for you. Um, this is a uh, piece of sculpted glass from an oh, Athens you. artist, uh, uh, Paul Bendezunas, and um, uh, those are only given out to Terry Third Thursday speakers. I also want to remind everybody to, uh, uh, when you're leaving the deck, just say Terry Third Thursday. That's kind of the secret pass to get out, and we'll cover your parking. 
um, and remind you in February, Richard Anthony with Synovus is going to be our speaker and hope you'll join us then. And uh, we're adjourned.